Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to be in Acts uh, chapter 17 today. Thanks for following along. It's one of my favorite stories in the New Testament. When, it's when uh, the Apostle Paul arrives in a city called Athens. And uh, we're going to read from 16 to 34 in just a second. I want to tell you a story from about... Um, it was actually like 12 years ago, like this week. Um, I've been coaching football at Parkside uh, since I moved here in 2008. Um, in 2012, a bunch of us coaches went together uh, to a coaching clinic down in Notre Dame, uh, which was very cool, except that I'm a Michigan fan, so being at Notre Dame was very much enemy territory. Um, but like, still historic school, beautiful, like the campus, it's an incredible place. Um, and we got to go to this coaching clinic and it was being led by like all like the Notre Dame coaches. They brought in some of their NFL friends. Like, it was incredible to be like in a room like learning from these guys um that season i was getting ready to learn i was gonna be coaching the following season for the first time linebacker position i'd never coached it before played it like a little bit when i was a kid but like this is all brand new so i'm like well i'm gonna be coaching linebackers next year so i'll go to like the the seminars and stuff for the linebackers walked in sat down seminar was maybe like the first one was like maybe an hour long if i understood five minutes of it that might be being generous like, I was so far in over my head. I don't know if you found yourself in a situation like this where you've been, like, it's a new job or a new place. or whatever, But, like the, like, the language they were speaking was very much English, but the words they were using were not my language. Like, I just know, like, they were talking about the game on a level I had never heard of before and talking about strategy and coverages. Only, like, I was just completely and utterly lost. The experience was amazing. Being there was awesome. Like, getting to tour the campus. But, like, I learned almost nothing because I just couldn't understand what they were talking about. It was just so far beyond what I had the ability to process. And we have to keep that kind of in mind when we talk about like our faith, we talk about uh, being Christians, and we talk about Christianity, especially to people outside of our faith and outside of what I call church world. The language we use is often extremely unfamiliar. Right? There's this own little subculture that we have here. There's a lot of insider terminology and things like that that make sense to us, to people who've been around church for a while, but to those outside, is completely foreign. And Paul encounters that when he goes to Athens. Like Typically when Paul is preaching, he's encountering people a lot of the times who are Jews, who understand his lang- literally his language and his history and his culture, so he can speak from that level. But when he goes to Athens, he's encountering people from a completely different culture and has to change how he approaches them and how he brings the message. So let's read from Acts chapter 17. I'm going to start in verse 16 today. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him, they brought him to the Areopagus and said, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. If you bring some strange things to our ears, we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with the inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined and allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him. And find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And even as some of your own prophets have said. For we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring. We ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone. An image formed by the art or imagination of man. The time of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. By a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. 
Now, when they heard of this resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again on this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. There's a lot going on here today in this story, but what I want to do is just walk through it piece by piece together and see what we can learn from Paul's approach to the Athenians about how we actually speak and bring Jesus into our own culture, and our own world. So let's take a walk through this passage together, beginning in verse 16, where it says, Now while Paul was waiting in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him. Um, so he arrived in Athens because, well, as had begun to be a bit of a pattern for Paul's life. He'd gotten chased out of a couple of other cities. He'd been in a place called Thessalonica and gotten chased out of there by the Jews who were trying to, to kill him. And so he went to a town called Berea, and he'd gotten chased out of there by the same group of people. So now the believers had kind of shipped him off to Athens where they thought he would be safe. And he was in Athens waiting for two of his companions, guys named Timothy and Silas. He was waiting on them to catch up to him. And while he was there, like, you know, what does one do when you're in Athens? You go and see the sights. So he toured around. He explored the city. It was about AD 50 uh, when Paul would have been there. And so this is like Athens was still a great and major city, a historical city, but it was about 500 years past its peak at this point. So like, like some of the famous tourist attractions that we'd go to see now, like the Parthenon, all those kind of things, they were 500 years old by the time Paul got there. And really, like, uh, Greece's peak and Athens' peak of their, like, their strength and their power had been about 500 years earlier. The population at this point had dwindled down to 25 or 30,000 people, but it was still world-renowned, namely for its university, uh, for its culture, and for its architecture. And it still is today. Of the city, the city is actually it's named for Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom, and they were known for worshiping more than 30,000 different gods within the city of Athens. Many of them had their own, their own idols. There were 3,000 some odd public statues, plus temples and other places of worship scattered all around the city. One of their own historians, a guy named Pausanias, said it's easier to find a god than a man in Athens. It's interesting. And but the same guy, Pausanias, also said this, that the Athenians greatly surpassed others in their zeal for religion. So they took this worship of all their gods quite seriously. It was a very important thing to them. In all of this, Paul spent, we don't know, days or weeks wandering the city, and he would go to the synagogue each day, and he would go to the marketplace each day, and he was provoked. He was provoked by, he sees all the idols, he sees the temple, he sees the worship happening, and it provokes something within him. And the, the word there really, like, that word provoke, like, imagine, like, is there, like, a particular sound that just, like, grates on your nerves? Right? Everyone's like, yeah, please don't do it. I won't. I'm not going to make it like, like, imagine like that, that reaction you have when you, ha- you hear that sound. That's what the word kind of implies. That like, every time he hears it, like, just, like, so every time he would pass an idol, he's like, I can't, and then you see somebody offering a sacrifice. It was just, it was just eating him up inside. Day after day after day. Ray Stedman, a known uh, writer and uh, commentator, says this, is that, Each idol revealed that these men and women of Athens had a great capacity for God. They knew there was something beyond man. They were seeking for it. But each each idol also revealed a twisting, a distorting of that capacity, and a sabotaging of it. They were pursuing God. They wanted something more. They understood there was something more beyond them. But they had twisted it so deeply and gotten so far off the path of where truth was actually laid, that they were horribly, horribly lost. So in verse 17, so it says, So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. In the synagogue, that was Paul's, uh, his rhythm. Every time he went to a new city, the first place he would go was to the synagogue. If there was a synagogue in the city, he would go there, find the Jewish people, and preach, and talk to them about Jesus. And in the synagogue, he's talking to his people. Paul was a Jew. Right? He was a Jew who grew up in the Roman Empire like they did. He spoke their language, and they knew each other's history. He could tell them the entire story of Christ based from the Old Testament. He could talk about the creation narrative that they understood. He could talk about the laws and the sacrifices that they had followed, and he could point to how Jesus was the fulfillment of all the prophecies that they knew and had waited on for generation after generation. He could go into all that stuff in detail because they understood it. But he goes to the marketplace, in this public area in Athens called the Agora, And he's speaking to people there who have no connection to his Jewish history, no knowledge, even awareness of who Jesus was. 
his starting point has to be substantially different. If he started talking about the Jewish faith, they wouldn't know what he was talking about. If he starts talking about Jesus, they're like, who's this guy? Are you him? Like, they would have no way to understand what that would mean. This place called the Agora, this open square in the heart of Athens, just down the hill a little bit in the shadow of the Parthenon. Surrounded by government buildings and idols and temples, this open area, was, this is the place where people came to come and share and exchange ideas. It was in this spot where the form of government called democracy took shape. It was in the Agora where, uh, where philosophers like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle shared their ideas and taught their students. People came here all the time, day in and day out, to listen and to learn and to argue and debate. So of course it's where Paul wanted to be. Of course Paul wanted to be there to come and speak. But he had to find a way in. And as he's speaking, he's sharing, he's in this open marketplace, and people are overhearing his ideas, and they're like, this guy's saying weird things. We don't understand him. So he begins to get an audience, and that goes into verse 18, we'll get there. But Paul was provoked. It provoked something in him. When he was provoked by their idol worship, when he was provoked by how they were living, when he was provoked by what he saw in the city, it provoked him to go and share the gospel. It provoked him to go and preach. The question is, what provokes us? What gets at you? What grates on you? And how do you react to it? I see plenty of us who are provoked by the government. Plenty of us who are provoked by culture. Plenty of us are provoked by people, but I rarely see it provoking us to live out our faith more boldly. There's lots of things that provoke us. Lots of things that we like great in our nerves. Lots of things that we find important enough to yell about, to argue about, to write about, to comment about, to tweet about, to post about. Not typically very important things in my mind. Christians, it would do us well to remember this world is not our home. It may be the only home you've ever known, but this is not our home. Its politics are not our politics. Its policies are not our policies. We live here. We abide by the nation that we live in. We're here. We, like, we can love this place and care for this place and certainly care for the people, but do not make this your primary priority. Do not get sucked into that vacuum. It's a spiral of death. We are people who focus on the gospel of life. That should be what provokes us. That and that alone. The other stuff literally means nothing. It means nothing. Verse 18. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. So he's in the Agora, and some of the philosophers come to him and they said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he's preaching about Jesus. The Epicureans were a particular philosoph like, philosophical movement that was popular and strong in Athens. They were like, like the expression you've ever heard, like, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. It's essentially a summary of their philosophy. They believed that the God, like they believed in the Greek gods, they believed they were remote from us, that they didn't care, that they weren't involved with humanity or had anything to do with them. And the Stoics, which is like, where we get our term, like when, somebody, when we say somebody is Stoic, right, in, their, in the kind of their being, they're kind of quiet and reserved. The Stoics took the idea, they were more a pantheist, they kind of took the idea that everything is really kind of God and he's part of all of us and we are God. But for them, their expression would be, whatever's going to be is going to be. Nothing we can do to change it. There's nothing beyond this life to worry about or look forward to. It's just this life it happens. It'll come. It'll end. The world goes on and on. Don't let it bother you. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And so they hear Paul talking about these things and they're like, what is this guy talking about? Specifically, they say, what is this babbler getting on about? And that word babbler, it's actually got like a specific meaning. And originally it talked about, referred to like a bird, like pecking its seeds. And then in, in the Greek culture, it came to me and somebody who like would go to the market and kind of like follow the different carts around and pick up scraps that have fallen off the carts. And after that, it came to me and somebody who just kind of cherry picked different ideas from different philosophies and would just spout nonsense. So they would talk, they knew what they were talking about. They would just kind of, but they only knew like little bits of different things. So they were saying Paul is one of these guys. So he's just babbling on him. He's, he's just grabbing from different ideas and different philosophies and different ideas. He doesn't really know what he's talking about. Like, What's this babbler getting on about? And somebody else, they go like, oh, I think he's, he's speaking about some kind of foreign divinities. He's going on about some foreign divinities. And what's interesting about that, that word divinities is that like, it actually comes up 62 other times in the New Testament. And every other time it's written, it's translated as demons or demon. 
So they're not saying he's talking about gods. They're saying he's talking about something evil. He's talking about some foreign demon. Which is interesting and ironic because Paul would tell them clearly that you guys are the ones worshiping demons and inviting demons in. There's deep irony there. He would say later on in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, no, I imply that what, what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to participate with demons. This is maybe a bit of an aside point, but like when we talk about other faith systems and other religions, other cults and things that, that exist in our world, we believe in the one true God, the only God worthy of worship. But that doesn't mean these other things don't have real power. Understand that. that the spiritual and demonic forces in our, in our world, in our realm, are very real. And they exist behind and prop up these other beliefs. Do not mess with them. Do not dabble with them. They're not to be trifled with because there is real power there. Paul tells us as much. Be careful, stay away from it, flee from it. But they thought these things. They thought he was a babbler. They thought he was talking about demons because he was talking about Jesus. And this idea of Jesus was so foreign to anything they had ever heard, they couldn't wrap their heads around it. He saw with this idea that a God loved them, that a God had come to the earth because he cared for them, and God had died on, in their place, on their behalf, so that they could be saved. These ideas made no sense to the Greek culture. They couldn't conceive of that. They couldn't conceive of a God that loved them and cared for them. As it was then, it's not unlike that today. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. We shouldn't be surprised when the message of the cross and the message of Jesus Christ makes no sense to people outside of the faith. It's not meant to, because it's countercultural. Verse 19 through 21 says this. And they took him, they brought him to the Areopagus and said, May we know that this new teaching about, that you are presenting, if you bring strange things to our ears, we wish to know, therefore, what they mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. I love that Luke adds that in there. He's like, oh, he's like, these Athenians, all they ever wanted to do was debate and argue. It's Areopagus, it's a place, and, it, and it's a place and a people. It's a place, up, like again, up in that same area near the Parthenon, and the, kind of in the shadow, and there's a place there called Mars Hill, where Paul is famously said to have given this speech that would come. So it was a, it was a physical location, but it was also... The people, the Areopagus, they were named, this council was named that because of where they met at, at that place. And in the time of Athens' peak, you know, 500 years earlier, it would have been this group of about 600 uh, men who were like, the, they were essentially the, the early form of government. Matters of civic and, and uh, philosophical and religious uh, duty were all tied up and discussed and debated through them. By Paul's day, it had dwindled, it was smaller, but they still held a lot of power and a lot of authority. So being invited there and being invited to have an audience with them was not a small thing. He wasn't on trial, like he had been or would be in other, in other places. But he was very much speaking to the authorities in that city. Now it says that some laughed and some insulted him. Many ignored him completely. But many of them were hungry for more. When he was out, in the, out in, the, in the marketplace. Some just walked away, some mocked him. But enough of them were hungry to hear more that they invited them to come and speak. You know, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that, you know, God has put eternity in our heart. That he has set something within us that makes us crave, makes us desire, makes us search, makes us reach for something more. Something I hear way too often, like, just in, like, in pastoral circles and like, like people writing about Christianity in the church and the, and the church in the West and all these things, I hear over and over again, is that, well, people don't really want to hear about Jesus anymore. People aren't really interested in faith anymore. And I don't buy that for a second. It's not true. As our culture, like, is our culture like representing like, like this classic like Judeo-Christian like mindset anymore? No. Were they ever? Yeah, I'm not really sure that that's ever true anyway. You have a way of romanticizing the past, the way we think things were. But just because our culture has changed does not mean what God has set in humanity's heart has changed. People are craving and thirsting and hungering for the eternal. They are after it and pursuing it, and they want it. And when I, talk, when I interact with people who don't know Jesus, they're open. 
They're open to hearing about faith. They're open to hearing about God. They're open to hearing about what Christianity has to say. What they're done with is hypocrisy. What they're done with is religion. What they're done with is people who want to put themselves on a pedestal for no reason. I'm done with that. It's annoying. It's horrible. Christians are brutal for it. It's a way of being full of ourselves that we have no right to be. They might be done with that, but they are not done with faith. Don't buy it. Don't believe it. Don't allow yourself to get jaded about our world, about the people in it, because there is so much reason for hope. So much reason for hope. We're hardwired to want to know and to seek for more. It's built into us. Verses 22 and 23. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed your objects of worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. Paul gets his chance, Paul gets his opportunity to speak, and he immediately seeks to connect with their culture. Now, what he thinks of their culture has already been established, right? We talked about like earlier, the, the, the cringing. Like when he walked around the city, he was, like, he was just horrified by what he saw. So he could have started there. He could have said, man, you guys are dumb. He could have ripped them apart. He could have said, you got all these dumb, you know, these items are meaningless, right? He could have opened with that. He'd be not a great opener. He takes a softer edge. He tries to find a way to connect. He tries to acknowledge something about them so he can build a connection. He says, hey, he's like, I perceive that you're really religious. He's like, I see that you're really interested in these things. I see that you desire to worship. He even points out, he's like, he's like I, saw, I found a statue in your city that's an unknown God. And by the way, they found examples of that, of that unknown God, the statues that in, other, in other Greek and Roman cities. It's a common practice because they, they worshipped this plethora of deities. It wasn't un, unusual for them to like, so like, each god had its own realm that existed in, right? If you were going off to war, you might go and offer a sacrifice to Zeus. If you were looking for help with love, you might go and offer a sacrifice to Aphrodite. Um, if you're, you know, heading out on a, on a sailing trip, you might go and offer something off to Neptune. And if you had something coming up and you didn't really know what god that would need the sacrifice, you'd go to the altar of the unknown god and hope that the message got through. Right? That was, that's essentially how they handled it, which, I mean, it's not a bad theory. And so when Paul comes to me, he says, look, he's like, I, he's like, I see that you're really religious. He's like, I see that you acknowledge it. You realize there's a God out there that you don't know yet. Well, that God that you don't know yet, let me tell you about him. It's a fascinating place to start to connect directly with their faith, directly with their religion, and bring something out of it. He didn't ridicule them. So he took a humble approach. And it's one that I think we could learn really well from. Because here's the thing I mentioned already, that Christians have this, ha- that <laughs> this way of being arrogant and insufferable, which is so far apart from who Christ was. And it's particularly in things that are going on in our culture. I know there are so many things about our culture and stuff that, that upset people now, especially people of Christian values. I get it. I understand it. But I find myself in no position to hold judgment over those who don't know Jesus. I find myself on no moral high ground or spiritual high ground or otherwise to look down on them. I have no reason to be self-righteous. I I just don't. I have no reason, no opportunity to look down on them. All I have is the greatest story ever told. All I have is the true story of Jesus Christ who loved me so much a wretched, miserable sinner that he gave his life on my behalf so that I could be united with him. That's where I come from. That's the story I can bring. I can't come from up here and speak down to them, even though I'm literally standing on a stage speaking down to you. I can't hold that place in a relationship. I have no right, no right whatsoever. A quote uh, from a uh, theologian named D.A. Carson, he says it like this, all we are as Christians at our best our poor beggars telling another one where to find bread. That's it. It's all we are. May we never hold a position higher than that. May we always be committed that we are these beggars who have been given a gift and that is our job to go and find others and show others where that gift is to be found. Having given those instructions now, Paul established the connection to their culture and now he begins to turn and tell them about Jesus. Now he begins to build his case for his faith. He begins in verses 24 and 25 by talking about God as creator. 
says this, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives himself to all mankind breath and everything. Now, it's worth pointing out, I think I mentioned maybe in past weeks, that like, this would be an abbreviated version of Paul's speech of what Luke has recorded for us is like just like the highlight reel, right? Like the bits of the sermon that got put up on like Instagram the following week kind of thing. His actual message would have been probably hours long, right? Maybe a day of speaking and sharing and debating and talking uh, with these guys. We get just the highlight reel of it. But Paul's being very specific in what he's sharing. He's being very targeted in how he's coming about uh, bringing the gospel to them. He's framing it in a language that's familiar to them. He starts with establishing a doctrine of creation. This is the God who made the world and everything in it. For them, there was no idea about this. Greeks had many ideas about where, like, about where the world came from. All kinds of debate, all kinds of philosophy, all kinds of theories about how the world began or if it ever even had a beginning. Some of them thought it was the cyclical that went around and around in eternity. So starting here was absolutely critical to establish that the one true God made all of it. Made all of it. Not one God was over the sea. Not one God was over the air. Not one God was over the dirt. Not one God over this. There's one God over everything. Extremely countercultural for them. And then they move on from there. Not only is there one God who created, there's one God who is Lord over heaven and earth. Everything in it. Again, for them, there are different gods over different matters, different areas. For them, the idea that there could be one God who superseded over everything was outside of their realm of, of, uh, of understanding. Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2 says, The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. For he laid his foundation on the seas and established it on the rivers. Everything that is in the world belongs to God, is made and established by him. And then he moves on. He goes, and he doesn't live in temples made by human hands. Now he's starting to get, he's starting to poke around at them a little bit. And it's funny that he, like, like him saying this again, like where he's standing have you seen shots of Griezmann back when the Olympics were there or whatever? Like the Parthenon up on the hill, right? He's standing you know, less than a kilometer, maybe only a couple hundred meters away from that, almost literally in the shadow of it, and in this area surrounded by other temples. Maybe as people were passing by him, going to and from temples, offering sacrifices. So you can see him pointing up. He's like, God doesn't live in temples made by humans. Their city was full of temples made by humans, it's supposed to be the dwelling place of the gods. He's like, he's not there. He can't be contained in that. Psalm 40, verse 6 says this, You don't delight in sacrifice or burnt offering. You open my ears to listen. You do not ask for a whole burnt offering. He goes on to say, He's not served by human hands. God's not interested in sacrifices. He's not, he's not pleased by your sacrifices. And if, if you've been around a while, you might be thinking, well, So then what does the whole Old Testament do? Then? Like, if God doesn't want sacrifices, why did he set up a sacrificial system? It's a fair question. It was never for his benefit. He had no desire for those things. It was always for our benefit. The people needed a way to express their repentance. needed a way, a physical way they could go and show that they were sorry to God. It was always about them. Not what he needed, not what he wanted, but what the people needed. Sacrifices weren't about him needing to be pleased or needing to be, needing to be satiated. Verses 26 to 28. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. And he's actually not far from each one of us. It's interesting. Again, he's being deeply intentional in what he's saying and how he's saying it. To say from one man, every nation came. The Greeks... Famously referred to anybody who was a non-Greek as barbarians, right? Literally, like they call them barbarians because that's how, like they, they mockingly would say their languages their languages sound like bar 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 bar. So they called them barbarians. That's where it came from. The Jews, anybody who was non-Jewish, they would just call them Gentiles. Now oh, you're all the same, just Gentiles. And in both cases, they meant that they were lesser than them. Saying so we're we're here, everybody else is lesser. Athenians were famously proud. I'm talking about like the, the Athenians who were homegrown were from Athens. They held themselves even as better than the rest of the Greeks. Like, no, no, we are pure Athenian. It's heartbreaking that we have to talk about this in 2024. But the notion that any human being would be lesser than another is, is so fundamentally unbiblical. 
as to be nonsense. Genesis 1.27, the first chapter of the Bible. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. There is but one race, and it is the human race, people. May we never forget it. I'm tempted to go deeper on that, but another time. One man over it, one man from every nation, from one man every nation, that they should seek God, that they should seek God. His providence, his control over all things is meant to provide evidence to us. God is clearly searchable. God is clearly able to be known because he is ruling over all these things. He didn't just set the world in motion and walk away and leave it spinning. He is deeply concerned and deeply involved in our creation. God has revealed himself as both the creator of the world, the ruler of the world, and the sustainer of it. He holds all these things together in the hopes that we would find him and turn to him. Romans 1 says it like this in verses 20, then 22, and 23. For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what has been made. As a result, people are without excuse. If they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men, birds, and four-footed animals and reptiles. Paul's clear in the Romans saying, God has made himself abundantly findable. God has made his truth evident in the creation of the world. He can be seen and known. He's there. And even though that evidence is clear, even though the evidence of the creator is out there, we choose to worship the created. We'd rather make an idol that we can hold in our hand and look at and touch. The living God made himself known. We'd still rather worship what we can create. And he's not far from each of us. This is fascinating for the Greeks. God, we know, is omnipresent. That's a fundamental doctrine of who God is. But to the Greeks, they believed that if they believed in the gods at all, they believed that they were far off, that they were aloof that they're on some distant mountaintop in some distant temple. They didn't care about humanity, but maybe if you offered just the right sacrifice, you might curry just enough favor with them to come and pay you some mind, but they did not care about the world. But for us, God deeply cares about us. Paul argues God is separate from creation, but deeply involved in it. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 11 says this, talking about God and us. He, watch, he watches over his nest like an eagle and hovers over his young. He spreads his wing and catches them and carries them on his feathers. It's like painting a picture of God as like this, like the mother bird, right? Taking care, of, taking care of her young, hiding them underneath the cover of her wings. That's how much God cares about us. He holds us that close. And then he goes and he turns in verse 28 and Paul goes and quotes some of their own philosophers. He says this in verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. And even as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. I love that. And Paul does this in a few other of his letters too. He refers to other, other Greek poets and things like that. Because he's drawing on their own culture. He's drawing on their own writings. Things that are written talking about their gods. He's now taking and applying to the one true God. He's being, I would say, culturally bilingual. He understands their culture and he can take it and he can speak it into truth. In him we live and move and have our being is from a, a prophet, or not a prophet, sorry, a philosopher named Epimenides from 600 BC. And for, for indeed we, have, we are his offspring is from a poem written by Aratus around 300 BC. Writings that the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers would have known well and would immediately recognize when he quoted them. We need to be able to understand and to speak the culture around us. And we can't take for granted that, like, like for those of you who have been around church and Christianity for most of your life, we can't take for granted that you understand your neighbor's culture. Just because we live beside people does not mean we know their culture. It's not true. And I'm not just talking about if your neighbors may happen to be from, have moved here from another region or from another country. I'm not even just talking about that. It could be people that have grown up in St. Thomas right beside you your whole life. But their cultural outlook, their worldview is likely fundamentally different than yours. So you actually have to do some work to go and understand it. Missions agencies and Bible colleges, they invest all kinds of time and money in training missionaries, teaching them how to go and understand culture. Some of the fundamental things they learn. They don't, they don't teach them typically about the culture they're going to. They teach them how to interpret and study and learn from a culture. So wherever they go, 
They can get in there and find out, figure out how to interpret, how to understand it, and then how to build truth through that. Every Christian, whether they don't care where you live, we all need that training. We need to learn how to understand the culture around their language and their way to help them understand it's our job and our responsibility. Move on to verse 29. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by art and the imagination of man. Think about this, right? This is, this is the philosophy that Paul is building here. He says, if we are the offspring of God, so he's established like we're God's offspring, in other words, God's, God's creation, created by him, how could he then possibly dwell in something that we created? You get that? So he's up here. He created us. And if we create some little metal or stone idol, how could the guy from, how could he fit into that? Paul's like, it doesn't work. That's what he's telling you. He's telling you things like, it doesn't make any sense that you'd be able to contain him in some idol that you've created. Because those idols you made, they're de- by definition, the offspring of you. Like they're created by you. If you're created by God, you can't, you can't contain him into that. Psalm 115, verses 4 through 8, says it like this. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they don't speak, eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear, and noses, but they don't smell. They have hands, but they can't feel, but they they have feet, and they do not walk. They do not make a sound in their throat. Those who made them become like them. So do all who trust in them. That last line, those who make them become like them. So do all who trust them. What's the implication there? If we're making and worshiping idols... We lose the ability to see, to hear, to speak, to understand. We become like stone. So if we humans are living and breathing in conscious beings, and we are the creation of God, then he must be something even greater than ourselves, not less. Our God can't simply just be this like little stone statue. Because if he has created us in, the, myth, like in the, the magnificent way that he has, as complex as we are, then he must be infinitely more complex than that. So there's no way he can be contained in an idol. Now, I know what you're thinking, right? Like, well, we don't worship stone idols, and we're smarter than that. We're not, we don't do that anymore. We're better. No, no. We're just as idolatrous as the Greeks were. Probably more so. Um, we're not likely as intelligent as they were either. Um, there's a passage in the book of Jeremiah that... Um, like for me, has always really helped like understand this idea of like idol worship. Uh, Jeremiah writes this: God speaking through Jeremiah, saying this: For my people have committed a double evil. Double evil. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living waters, and they have dug cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that hold no water. It's from a longer passage where God's almost like it's like, the, it's like God's putting Israel on trial. He says, first they rejected me, then he calls himself the fountain of living waters, the one who can forever quench their thirst, ever, forever quench their need and their desire for eternity. They've rejected me, the fountain of living waters. And over here, they've dug for themselves these cisterns that don't hold any water. He's speaking to the people in Jerusalem. They're about to be, about to be conquered and taken into exile. And he means by these cisterns, Jerusalem in that area was notoriously dry. Getting fresh water was a challenge. So people would dig these cisterns, basically these wells that would catch rainwater. Right? And they, they'd use that to keep fresh water in their homes and in their, in, their, in their areas as best they could. But they were notoriously prone to cracking. So your cistern could be full and all of a sudden a crack could develop somewhere in it and the water would leak away. You're left with nothing. And what God is saying, he's like, your gods, your idols, what you're worshiping, is like that cistern. You expect it to fill you. You expect it to hold everything you need. And somehow you're shocked and surprised every time you come back to it and it's empty again. You've rejected the fountain of living waters, one that could sustain you forever, and you're over here trying to fill your cup with this broken cistern that could never, ever sustain you. You might not bow down to a stone or a metal god, but we bow down to all kinds of other gods ourselves. Whether it's sex or money or power or influence, the clothes that we want, the grades we think we need, the career, the house, the car, the muscles, the boyfriend, the girlfriend, we fill our cisterns. We fill ourselves with the things we think we need, the things we think we want, the things we think will take care of us. And we come back in the morning, it's all leaked away and we're empty again. We're shocked and dumbfounded all over. We've rejected the fountain of living waters. 
to broken cisterns. We are no smarter than they were, just as prone to idolatry. Verses 30 and 31. Times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. The time of ignorance that God has overlooked, Paul's going, Paul's going for the jugular now. He's saying, he's like, look, he's like, God ignored your sin for a long time. He's kind of looked the other way, but that time is now coming to an end. That time is over. We are without excuse. Repentance is required now. Jesus has come. It's time to change. Because if you don't, there's going to be punishment. He, says, he gives assurance by raising him from the dead. Acts 11, verse 18 says this. When they heard, uh, when they heard this, it became silent. And they glorified God, saying, God has given repentance, resulting in life, even to the Gentiles. We can think sometimes of this need to repent as almost like a punishment from God, like, like oh, you've been wrong, and so he forces us to repent. Where repentance is actually, it's a gift granted. Like, we're the ones that rejected God. We're the ones that walked away from him. We're the ones that committed sin. So he, by every right, could have said, done with you. We built the faulty cisterns. He could have said, great, live with it. You're done. But instead, he bridged the gap back towards us. He offered us forgiveness. He sent Jesus Christ to die on our behalf. He paved a way to back to him for us. And that path is through repentance. So that's a gift. The, the walking away, the turning away from sin through repentance is a gift from God to us. And also says in that, in that verse, that he's appointed a time for judgment. Paul began his speech here by stating that the world had a beginning. Now he's telling them clearly that it's coming to an end. There's a time itself when all of humanity will stand in judgment. Romans 14, 11 and 12 says this, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, every tongue will praise to God, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. And then in John chapter 5, verses 27 through 29, And he has granted him the right to pass judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, because a time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good things to the resurrection of life, and those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of condemnation. And then the final piece of that passage that Paul argues, like, and he's got, like, the idea of the resurrection was absurd to the Greeks, as it is in our culture today. Nobody really understands that something could be raised from the dead. But Paul argues that, like, the proof that we will all be raised to judgment is in that he has raised Jesus from the dead. The first of the born of the dead is Jesus Christ. The proof that we can be raised back to life is there in Christ. It is coming for all humanity. So then in verses 32 to 34, we come to the end of this passage. We're left with what our response is to him. So Paul's, we don't really know if his speech ended. It sounds more like he got interrupted. He got to this topic of the resurrection. He started talking about being raised from the dead and how we'd all come and be raised to judgment. And people started to pipe up. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked him. Others said, hey, we want to hear some more about this. We want to hear you again. Come on back maybe next week. So Paul left. And some joined him and believed. Among them were Dionysius, the, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris and others with him. Dionysius was one of the, part of that council, one of those leaders. We see kind of three core responses to Paul's message. First, mocking. Right? Some are just like, this is dumb. This doesn't make any sense. Get it, like, we're done. If you're actively trying to share and live out your faith in our society today, you should fully expect to get mocked sometime. In fact, I would actually say, I'm like, if you've never been made fun of for your faith, you're doing something probably wrong. If you're flying that far into the radar with the people around you, then, or you've just surrounded yourself completely with Christians, which is actually just brutally lazy. Brutally lazy. So if you're flying under the radar for your faith, reevaluate. Maybe put yourself in some new places. Second response. Someone just wanted to put it off. They're like, oh, there's something interesting here. Maybe I want to, maybe I want to hear more, but like we'll talk about it another time. You hear that? Some people are like, people are just gonna be like, hey, you know what, like. I want, I'll think about it maybe, or like, you know, maybe, like, maybe like on my deathbed, maybe I'll, I'll come back to that and I'll pray to all the gods and hope I catch the right one, say the right words, and get to the good place, not the bad one. And the third response. There were a few who believed, a few who repented, a few that day who put their faith in Christ. We can't control a response. 
We have no responsibility for the response. Whether people choose to put their faith in Christ, whether they choose to repent and change, it's not on us. You can't coerce that. You can't force that. You can't push for that. And you certainly can't celebrate the victory for yourself when it happens. It is only and always a movement of the Spirit of God in someone's heart and mind. All we can control is being faithful to what we've been commanded to do, to go and share the gospel and speak life and love and truth into our world. We go speaking their language. We go trying to speak into their culture, which may not be ours, to speak words that will bring life, will bring understanding, and bring love in the hopes that everyone can hear. We learn from Paul that our responsibility is to bring that message to everyone in a way that they can understand it, in hopes that they will turn towards Jesus. Finish with this from Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer every person. Let's pray. God, give us opportunity, give us wisdom when we talk to those who don't know you. Give us grace. God, give us understanding. God, help us to know how to share you. God, help us to understand the culture, even our neighbors, even our coworkers, our classmates, to know where to start. Help us to see where they're hurting. Help us to see where they're broken. Help us to see where we can help. Help us to see where we can bring love and care to their life so that through that they can see you. God, may this place be filled with people finding Jesus, with people with questions, people with wondering, with people wanting to search out and discover more. May we be a people known for your love, for your grace, and for sharing it with others. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Faith. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning. Um, if you're still in the foyer, come on in. There's lots of seats available. Um, so my name is Kristen. I'm on staff here, and I just have a few announcements for you. Um, the first being parents. Remember, this is our second week of pickup for the kids upstairs in the classrooms. Make sure you have that little security tag. Um, the number that's on there matches with your child sticker. Um, so this is just a really great practice. Stick it on your clothes or on something else and keep that with you and have it with you at pickup time. Um, senior high as well. There's the hangout in the youth room after, so head down there after the service. If you see other uh, senior high students that are lingering around, invite them down to go with you as well. Uh, this Saturday from 9 until noon, uh, we are having a garden and landscaping, kind of like, we're going to call it a fun event. Uh, so bring some work gloves. If you have a particular tool, gardening tool you want to use, bring that along. Uh, but this is a great opportunity just to get outside, maybe meet some people you haven't been around before. Um, we're inviting all the youth out. We've got some big, strong men that'll come and help move some mulch, all sorts of good things. Um, I know my son, he is nine. He wants to come, so it's open to kids as well. And then next Sunday after the service, um, we have our newcomers gathering. So if you are new here, uh, whether it be two weeks or six months, and you haven't attended one of our newcomers gatherings, um, we want to invite you to attend that. You can sign up on the Church Center app, um, or you can stop by the Welcome Center or call the office during the week, um, and we can help sign you up for that. But this is a great opportunity just to come um, hear from some of our staff, meet some staff, um, all different things, but it's a great opportunity to meet other people who are new here as well. And the last thing I want to mention is giving at Faith St. Thomas. So there's lots of options for this. Um, you can give in person here on Sunday or during the week. There's two gray boxes um, located near the office or the front doors. Um, you can also set up pre-authorized payments through debit or credit, or you can give directly on the app or the website. But just know that your giving um, goes to a ton of different things and blesses uh, different ministries, different people. Um, but if you ever have any questions about that, you can call the office or reach out to Cindy, um, and we can give you all sorts of information, answer any questions that you have.